guys, it's Ben with Design3, and today I'm talking with David Helgeson, who is CEO of Unity Technologies. How are you doing today, David? I'm really good. Can you tell us a little bit about how Unity got started? So in 2004, we were still in a the basement. There was, like, there was no company, it was just three guys programming. Uh, but in the summer of 2004, we basically wrote a business plan sort of, you know, to get our heads straight and, you know, to figure out how we should do this. And the business plan basically described, you know, this company that would democratize game technology, game development, really, like, you know, bring this kind of advanced, complicated stuff that you need to make games to a mass audience, but still be good enough that the professionals would want to use it. It was not going to be like a hobbyist project or, or a sort of an, in, like a pure indie engine, for instance. It would be nice to the indies, but it would be good for everyone. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, there was this uh, one of the, the father of one of us. He, he then, you know, sat down with us to kind of help us with this planning. And at the end of the planning, he was like, "So, you know, what um, what do you need to execute this plan?" And we were like, you know, did all the math with Excel, and we came back and said, well, "Like, to build this company, we need thirty five thousand dollars," which kind of describes how naive we were because you know nobody tries to do that. Uh, but he gave us thirty five or borrowed lent us thirty five thousand dollars, and and that's how we built the company. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what is a typical day of work like for you? Um, you know, it's changed a lot over the years because, you know, when we started, we were three guys, and a typical day was like, you know, probably 16 hours long, and uh, included primarily programming, and and then over the years, like, you know, making the website, uh, making marketing material, uh, fielding customer questions when we started our beta period in 2005 and and then you know launching the product in the middle of 2005 um, and uh, you know lots of sales just trying to call people to convince them to buy unity which didn't work for a long time it was a really slow kind of growth initially because like for a company or any team actually to buy into a new piece of technology is very risky so people really held us at arm's length for a long time um, until we had sort of proven ourselves uh, and then um, you know we started growing and then you know we were you know over the years we basically sort of doubled every year well, since then almost um, so uh, so now we're 150 people and, and and suddenly like you know I'm actually not very useful anymore in sales for instance because there's really good people handling that you know I'm not very useful in customer support because there's really good people handling that you know I'm not making the website because there's really good people doing that so in the end you know the role of a CEO becomes you know a few things. I mean, one is kind of coaching and kind of, you know, talking to people internally to kind of, you know, help decisions get made. Not really make decisions, but really like, you know, empower people to make the decisions and then, you know, talk to them about the decisions so, you know, they feel safe about them and, of course, you know, sometimes fix them a little bit. Um, there is a lot of uh, kind of this kind of out, outgoing, like, you know, going and explaining to the world what Unity is and, and telling the story again and again and again. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and of course through that like understanding it better and, and learning learning it better and, and and sometimes getting new ideas on the way um, so there's some creativity into that and then um, um, you know talking to our, our investors and talking to the big customers and just sort of making sure that you know everyone understands what's going on and where we're going um, so they didn't really describe a day you know um, you know I, I wake up early in the morning I used to be a super late 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 guy but but now I wake up very early uh, because like while well, I've been sleeping, Europe, and we have offices all over, you know, including in Europe, um, Europe has been working. Yeah. So the first thing I have to do in the morning is like spend an hour reading email just so I know what's been going on. A few of them need responses and I'll quickly handle these. And then like, you know, then the day starts for real. Yeah. Um, typically, you know, with, with, you know, interviews and, and, you know, job interviews with people that we're hiring. And, um, talking to partners and yeah, attending some of these kind of, you know, sales calls. And then in, in like in, in my little openings in between, I'm reading the forums, I'm re reading Twitter, just so I kind of, you know, always have a feeling what's going, what's going on. I respond to a lot of Twitter messages. I unfortunately stopped responding so much on the forums just because I don't have time. Yeah. Uh, but Twitter is a perfect format yeah. for a CEO, actually. <laughs> it's, <laughs> you, <fast. laughs> it's very fast, it's very direct, and, you know, sometimes gets read by a lot of people, which is great. Uh, so it's sort of a, you know, force multiplayer uh, for, for, for thinking and, and, and uh, communication. Um, and then, you know, in the evenings, it's, you know, dinners with 
all kinds of people that I have to know. Uh, so it's, it's very broad, and, and uh, but often very hectic. Like, you know, it would be like 20, 30 minute talk, talk calls stacked one after the other. So in the evening, sometimes, you know, your brain is kind of melted, and then I get on my bike and I bicycle home, uh, which is like a 30 minute ride through the city. So it's, uh, you know, very calming, and, and uh, when I get home, I'm <laughs> Sorry, that was a long story. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, oh, it varies a lot, you know, there's yeah. a fair amount of travel, but actually I also find now that I used to travel a lot to go out like to Asia, to go to our different markets, to meet people, but I'm actually finding that, you know, the, the, the amount of time you spend on that is sometimes just better spent like, you know, sitting with a computer, with a phone and, you know, communicate with, with all, all our people. Yeah, so that kind of, uh, you kind of touched on it in that, but how has it, the transition been from going from a programmer to now a CEO of a big multinational uh, company? A small multinational small, company. Well, growing national. Growing. Multinational. Well, yeah. No, sorry. It's just when you think multinationals, you yeah. usually think whatever. Uh, anyway, no, um, it's, um, it's actually been very enjoyable. You know, I, I, um, I don't actually miss programming. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. But, you know, when, once, we, once I you know, got to know my co two co-founders well, and, and once we hired some of these, you know, incredibly brilliant people that are working with us, um, you know, I just realized that, you know, I was not actually that useful in programming, <laughs> uh, not compared to them anyway. And, uh, and I actually find, you know, doing the business stuff to be a pretty creative effort. Like, you know, always trying to see, you know, how can things be made better and, and you know, what needs are there in the market that we could fill. And I know it sounds really boring when you say it like that, but no, it's, it's you know, it's very, um, I don't know. And there's a lot of storytelling in it, like, you know, sort of figuring out what the story is and then telling it um, so that people understand it, whether it's external or internal. And I really enjoy that. I, you know, one of my favorite hobbies is conversation with good people. Mm -hmm. And I get to meet a lot of good people and, and have interesting discussions with them. So for me, it's been extremely enjoyable, actually. Have there been any kind of common, uh, you know, design challenges or even technical challenges that have come up as you've been building Unity? Oh, yeah. No, loads. Um, and any I kind of top? Let's see. Um, it feels more like a million small ones, actually, uh, on the product side, at least. You know, it's uh, and a lot of small ones where, like, you know, there's a natural um, sort of drift towards complexity in a product because over time, you know, it, it needs to serve more needs. There's more features. You know, the interplay between the features get more gets more and more complicated. Uh, so you actually have to push back all the time, like, keep it simple, let's remove this option, or at least, you know, make it not hidden, but like, you know, something that you have to kind of find in the documentation if you want to use this option because it's a niche option. So you don't put it in the, you know, in the application, don't put a checkbox because it just complicates things. Um, so one of the things that I think we've done really well and that I'm extremely proud of is just, is both, you know, the, the original founders, but also, you know, at least as much you know, the, the later, the, the team that we've, you know, built up, um, you know, has really, like, taken that to heart and really cares about these things. And one of my favorite things is, like, sort of these often late night conversations in the office where the engineers are kind of discussing, you know, how could we simplify this process? How could we, you know, remove this extra step from the workflow? Um, and, and having not just, like, one guy who cares about it, but, like, really growing the organization to care about it is, I think, what has, you know, has made Unity, well, so polished, and, and nice to use and, and you know, and they're therefore uh, successful. It's possibly the one, mo the, the single most important thing in, in the company's history. Um, but it's always a, a fight and, and like, you know, even now there's, you know, there are parts of Unity that are more complicated than they have to be, that haven't gotten the love they should get. Uh, and it's an impossible to, task to make things perfect, but you know, it's a constant struggle. Uh, you kind of talked a little bit about your team. How many people are in your team now, and how does the workflow between them go? Oh wow! Um, so, like, like I said, we're 150 people, um, and across nine offices in eight countries, okay. uh, which is obviously too many offices. Like, nobody <laughs> in their right mind would make, for a company of that size, nine offices. Um, and it happened primarily because of talent. So, you know, brilliant people sometimes can't move. Um, we can't hire every single brilliant person in the world, we can't make offices everywhere, but you know, when we could find a cluster of really good people, we would often, well, a few times, a handful of times, build you know, a, a comp uh, an office there. So we opened a facility in uh, Stockholm this summer. We opened a, um, we actually acquired a small company and then you know, kind of built with them 
a presence in uh, Montreal, up in Canada, um, and, and so on and so forth. And um, same, in, same in Brighton. Slightly different in Asia because there's more sales presence, sort of community management offices. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so far it's working really well because it turns out all these people are like from all these different places in the world. They're all very smart, they're all very passionate, <laughs> and they're very creative. Uh, and, and, and we also try to hire for niceness, like people that actually like care, you know, give up, give up. Um, and, 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 you know, yeah, care about the product um, and, and really want to take care of, you know, what they join. Um, so the result is, you know, a lot of long distance calls, a lot of Skype, a lot of emails, but actually a very tight knit group that, you know, really, you know, yeah, gives, gives a damn. Um, so the process, well, it's very, you know, the teams are very distributed, so the engineering is distributed, although it's mostly in Europe. Um, even, even our marketing, marketing department is split in two. So like some of the marketing is handled here in San Francisco, some in Copenhagen. Um, it's a weird structure, but it works well because it keeps some of marketing close to engineering. So they are like, you know, they, they can work together with engineering and the engineers understand what's happening in marketing. Um, some of it has to be here in San Francisco, so the press, uh, you know, engagement with the press and, um, you know, the running of the trade shows and conferences and stuff like that. So that's done here. Um, so it's just an example of how, how really fragmented the company is. Uh, and I think, you know, something like that can on, could only stick together because people are so, like, you know, wanted to work. Um, so how would you describe human, uh, Unity's company culture? Kind of like, what is the work environment like? Um, a lot of freedom. Like we really, um, and I think it comes from like three founders that really like don't like to be bossed around <laughs> and we don't like to boss other people around. <laughs> so so, so um, kind of in our own image, I guess we created this very sort of free culture, which is not just, you know, freedom comes with responsibility and it's not completely like free for all, but, but, uh, but as long as you really care, you know, and you do your job, then, you know, you're given in unrealistic amounts of freedom. <laughs> to do that um, and, and, and to express that. And uh, so, you know, the, we, for instance, we don't have centralized product management. So the engineers actually design the product, uh, which, you know, could fail in certain companies. But again, when, when everyone has been brought, in, brought into this culture of like, let's make it nice, let's make it simple, yet also flexible and powerful, um, that works pretty well. I mean, of course, it's just not every, it's not just every single engineer building a thing and like, deciding over it, but it's more sort of a collaborative, you know, Argument-based way way of you know steering steering the product um, and and Unity is a very complicated company if you think about it like we have 150 people sure there's a lot of people but the, the the complexities we face in the world are insanely big so for instance you know we we our customers are in like on every continent except possibly Antarctica although I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we have a user there um, and uh, and they are across all industries, pretty much. So like the game industry, which is not really one industry, it's a lot of different fields. We have customers in pretty, uh, pretty much every single of these fields and areas. We have customers, you know, in the sort of visualization space, in architecture, we have customers in, in like, you know, the military simulation area. Uh, we have uh, customers like, you know, that are building car configurators for showrooms. Uh, we have artists and, and, and DJs and, you know, musicians, all kinds of people that are using Unity to, to like, you know, express their things yeah. um, um, or, you know, train in their processes and whatever. It's a very, very complex uh, customer base. We have, you know, students, we have hobbyists, we have little kids, and we care about them all and we, you know, want to support them well. Then we have to be partners with all the companies that make the chips, you know, uh, whether it's the CPUs or the graphics chips, because we optimize with them, you know, we, we do partnerships with them to do different things. Um, we, uh, we have the marketplace, the asset store, where our customers are selling stuff to each other, where we have like, you know, hundreds of people that we have to engage with on that area. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably forgetting a few complexities, but if you think of this as like, you know, a multi-dimensional thing, and then, you know, 150 people is not enough. Like, how can, <laughs> how, how can only 150 people do all this? Yeah. Um, you know, we have, Every month we have 200,000 users using Unity. How can a small support team support them? So, so the only way to do it, we figured, was not to try to control it, not to try to design it too much, 
but let these you know, smart, passionate, creative people come up with the solutions for themselves. And it's a slight lie, so, but it's a simplification, let's say, to say that the only guidance we give them is the headline, which is, which is we want to democratize game development. So we didn't say we wanted to democratize game tools, for instance. We actually want to democratize, you know, enable people to do the whole thing. Um, and we're not helping them with everything yet. We're helping them with a few things. The asset store helps them get content together. The asset store helps them, you know, get things into their games or projects that, like, they don't have team members for. So you can buy characters, you know, scripts, audio, yada yada. That's a simple story. Um, and. Uh, and you know, sometimes it's about you know making the product easier to use. Sometimes you know, for some people in the company, it's about writing better documentation because that's a part of democratization. Like if you can't use it, that's not really you know available to you, and, and so on and so forth. You know, so, so the salespeople is about helping people buy Unity or helping teach people that they should buy Unity, you know, so they can be more empowered. Um, slightly self-serving, but the, you know that's, that's what works for both parties, it seems. Um, and 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 they do it. And they come up with all these solutions and they're super creative. And the only sort of thing uh, you know, we try to do is have them tell other people in the company about their solution. So sometimes we fix them if it's the wrong solution or we help them with it or, you know, so and so on. And, and it, it works really well. It's a very sort of conversation based culture, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And you kind of touched on it in that answer, but can you tell us more about the philosophy for Unity and, you know, the idea of an accessible, democratized game engine? Has that always been kind of the philosophy, or is it kind of pretty much? Okay. So, I mean, except in the early early days when we were just going to make games, but then we built this accessible engine for ourselves, um, and then quite early, like I said, 2004 or so, we basically figured that you know that would be the goal. We made one game, but that was more like for fun and, and sort of to, to try to try the tool out um, uh, and later. But um, but uh, yeah, no, it's pretty much been the the constant mantra for the company, and. Uh, you know, a, a, a vision statement or whatever you call it is, you know, can be measured by like the quality of a vision statement, the value of a vision statement can be measured in how well it guides the company and it's guided us extremely well. <laughs> like it answers a lot of questions, like should we do it like this or this? Well, you know, what democratizes most? What is, what makes Unity, you know, accessible to more people? Yeah, I mean, all these things. And, and then, you know, that's the road you take. And it's been a really good guiding light for us, and I, you know, we don't feel it's running out of steam. So you did kind of talk about some of the challenges you faced. What would you th say the hardest part of getting Unity up to where it is today? Has been? Um, that's a good question. I mean, first we just had to survive. Like if we had no money. We had thirty-five thousand. Well, we have thirty-five thousand dollars. You know, we took a loan from the bank. We finished the first game we did and actually got like a publisher deal where we got some money up front. Not a lot, but you know, some, some extra money. So all this money basically went into building the company and then we ran out of that money. And then we uh, basically could only rely, and this, they, it basically ran out at the same time as we launched Unity 1.0, which frankly, you know, was a product with a lot of promise, but it was not done or it was not awesome. Um, so very few, and, and also it had no marketing budget, it had no actually experience in PR and marketing around it. So it basically kind of fell flat in June 05 when we launched it. Um, and then very, very, very slowly over the next like two years, it started you know, growing in, there was a, you know, one user bought it and told his friends and you know, half a year later that friend bought it. So it was a very slow adoption cycle. And uh, so basically that time frame from like, you know, when we started coding to launch in 05 when we ran out of money, or pretty much, uh, and to sort of, you know, summer 07. So this all adds up to probably four years of, you know, an absolute walk in the desert. <laughs> so where at some point our friends probably didn't really understand what we were doing anymore because like, why wouldn't we just, you know, take a job? Uh, and we were like, you know, don't, I, I won't make too much of it, but we actually went hungry in some of these periods and it was, a struggle. I mean, we lived in Denmark, which is a pretty socialist society, you know, so, or, you know, um, so it's not like, you know, we would have starved. <laughs> they, they will actually give you unemployment money if you really go down. But so it wasn't like a risk in that sense. But it was a tough, 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 tough one because we didn't want to give up. Um, 
and, and then you know just convincing the few first customers that they should trust us, like three and, and then later like four, five, six, you know, guys with you know no backing and no big customers, no successes, like no games that are cool built on Unity, that they should trust us and build their product on Unity. That was probably probably the hardest kind of transition to make happen. And fortunately the technology was really good and we met some like sort of visionary people at bigger companies like Disney and Cartoon Network actually used Unity quite early. Um, so with these kind of wins, and they were small wins, I mean there were small teams typically, uh, well the Cartoon Network game was bigger, but so it started with these kind of trickle, you know, successes and then we could kind of use them, you know, both to, you know, both, I mean, bolster our own faith <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, um, you know, co convince other customers and other users. And, 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 you know, the fact that we had a sort of an indie community that started growing around Unity really helped, uh, you know, which is something we'll never forget. <laughs> so when people are afraid that we kind of forget our indie roots, I think that's, okay. there's zero risk in that. But, um, but um, yeah, and, and yeah, I guess, the, the, you know, these were definitely the, the toughest years. Then, you know, you, you face challenges like sort of growth challenges, which you know, frankly are kind of luxury problems. But still, they're hard enough. Like when we, um, you know, and, and maybe the, the time from when we were like 50 to 70 were the toughest. Because at that time you have to actually start building sort of communication processes and like the company has to have some internal kind of rules or at least ways of doing things. And before that it was like totally amorphous and at some point we had to have some structures. But we managed to kind of build these structures and that was tough on its own. But like I said, I mean, we were, you know, making, you know, growing very quickly and the revenue was good and customers loved us and, and all that. So, you know, I, I shouldn't complain too much about that period, <laughs> although it you know, was tough enough. Yeah. Okay, and so in your opinion, how important or valuable is the community of developers that kind of forms around a new engine or game development tool? It's um, extremely important. You know, I think, uh, you know, you could say that, you know, it's, uh, to use an poker expression, not that I'm a poker player, but <laughs> it's, it's sort of the new table stakes, right? I mean, you can't actually build, I think, any developer platform without a community. And nobody tries anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's a crazy idea. Um, so, you know, that, that's, because without that, first of all, like, you know, people won't um, hear about it because developers trust their peers more than any marketing. <laughs> Right, so, so first, like nobody's gonna hear about it if there isn't a community. Then, you know, it's impossible to support a complex product without a community, cost effectively. Uh, so if, if, if you have a free version and a low priced version of, of your software, like you can't really afford to field like, you know, a very long complicated support calls. So the only way to avoid support calls is, you know, a polished product, good documentation and tutorials and a great community. And, and you know, that's, that's how we can keep the price down, of course. Otherwise, you know, we, we would have drowned years ago. Um, and it's also like, you know, at least with Unity, like the community is very friendly and nice. So it's just, you know, it's actually a pleasant place to be, <laughs> whether it's, you know, at our yearly conference or, or you know, on the forums and all these places. Um, and, uh, and it's a pleasant way to, to kind of place to come and learn and make friends and so on. And, you know, we, we still kind of love, love doing that. That's great. Uh, what can Unity users look forward to in the upcoming Unity 3.5 release? Um, a lot of stuff. And uh, so 3.5 is a minor update, which we should have <laughs> called 4.0, <laughs> but we were nice, generous people, so we decided not to. Um, it's, it's also what we call the sort of first fruit of the AAA initiative. So, so, so Unity was always perceived as a low-end engine that could you know, serve small teams well on small platforms, but few people actually trusted it for larger projects. Over the years that started happening, so more and more big companies and teams are using Unity, and they naturally started demanding more stuff from it. They wanted higher-end features, they wanted easier workflows for big teams, and uh, they basically wanted to push into the sort of AAA a area. So we, we, a year ago we realized, okay, you know, we're going to fall short and we're going to disappoint these customers if we don't deliver like a fully AAA product. Uh, so what we did, we started recruiting a lot of people from like basically big game companies that have worked on, you know, whether it's the Frostbite engine or, you know, IO Interactive, which is an IDOS company now, Square Enix company, uh, engine and so on. So we hired a lot of these people and they started building the sort of, you know, next step. Uh, 
And that's been in the works for a year now, and we're basically very, very close to delivering it. Um, so we're in, in, a, in an early beta with 3.5, which delivers, you know, a uh, lot of stuff like HDR rendering, uh, it, it has uh, like pathfinding, it has um, sort of gamma correct rendering, it has a, an occlusion system which allows you to have like very big worlds. Um, it optimizes a lot, like memory management is way more eff efficient and so on. But maybe, and there's a few other sort of, a lot of others actually cool features, but, but maybe, maybe the most important one is actually on the workflow side. So integration with uh, version control systems, ability to build huge projects without running out of memory, you know, much, much, much faster, um, um, and the ability to much, much faster um, share work with each other. So instead of like having to tra transfer files uh, and re-import them, which can take like, you know, hours, uh, which is a problem for mo a lot of big teams, whether it's using Unity or not, and, and sort of reaching a sort of a theoretical maximum of, of seconds or minutes to do these same things. So a lot of features like that, uh, some of which are many, very much sort of under the hood, um, is you know, what's ma mainly coming. The other <coughs> main thing, which is probably as big in 3.5, which is sort of a separate direction, and it's cool when you're growing as a company, you can actually do more than one thing, um, is that we're um, enabling export to Flash. So instead of running uh, on iOS, Android, uh, standalone application, three co the three current gen consoles, um, and our own browser plugin. You can also run now in inside the Flash plugin. Uh, so you build the game, you can deploy it to all these platforms, and you can build it where basically you can host it inside the the Flash plugin, which means that like 98 percent of on, of people on Earth can play your game without installing anything, which is kind of cool. Um, we have a similar piece of technology that we've wor been working with uh, uh, Google on in Chrome. Um, it's something called uh, Native Client, which allows you to run like native code in a secure way inside the browser. So Unity will support this as well. So uh, you know, so the other angle of 3.5 is basically a you know much easier web distribution. Uh, I'm sure there's other stuff that I'm forgetting, but you know, it's, it's a big package, and the yeah. developers have been you know flocking to it uh, to make. Um, and, and, and the way we develop features is, you know, we come up with concepts, we develop them, and then, you know, we basically put them into a version, a release when they're done. So we've already cut some things and, and are moving things around. Yeah, it sounds really looking forward to it. It's, <laughs> pretty, it's a pretty exciting product. Uh, we have a question from one of our community members, <laughs> cool. and they were wondering, what is the likelihood that Unity will support Win8 Metro and Windows Phone 8? It's uh, possible. That's pretty much all I'm, we can say now. Okay. And it's, you know, it, this, this comes back to how we work and how we think. So, you know, we don't promise things that we are not going to deliver. Um, we've failed a few times in the past, but we're pretty careful. Um, and so what we do is, you know, when, once we're sure about something, we, we, we talk about it. So, of course, we're exploring, you know, we've dabbled with it. We've actually worked with Microsoft a bit on it. And... Uh, We'll see, but uh, you know, un until we're sure and have really committed to it, we're not going to announce it. Okay. Um, so where do you see Unity five years from now? Or where do you hope Unity will be five years from now? I hope it's the product has become you know, even better in infinitely many ways, <laughs> including some ways we can't predict right now uh, because technology moves so fast. Uh, I hope you know, the, the, the company will retain its same culture. It will be bigger. We don't know how much bigger, but you know, as big as it has to be to support, you know, the, the great product. Um, and uh, you know, we'll have offices in more locations. You know, we'll be better able to support our customers in Asia, which we've already already ramped up quite a lot in the last year. But hopefully, we'll get to a point where we can really be on the ground pretty much everywhere. Um, we want to, you know, tie the community better together. Um, give them better tools to work together and things like that. Um, and beyond that, I don't know. I mean, as long as we can keep this vision of democratizing game development intact, um, you know, that's anything we do. And, and, and as long as everything we do falls under that vision, I'm pretty fine with it. Um, but I'm sure, like, you know, we'll be kind of inventing new ways of doing that in the future. We have another question from one of our community members. I'm guessing they're probably a job seeker right now, but is mm -hmm. Unity currently hiring? Oh, yeah. Um, specific positions? 
every single position you could imagine uh, across unfortunately not all our offices we don't just hire and like we, we hire only some positions in some offices uh, but pretty much every position you could imagine um, we are hiring looking for we're like a, like I said 150 now I think we have 50 open positions currently um, and uh, you know in particular great engineers um, you know but actually whether it's great you know engine engineers web engineers uh, you know game developers, like people that are, have really strong skills in game development, technical artists, um, also business development and salespeople, uh, you know, support tech writers. We're pretty much look at this, like, uh, you know, UI designers and, and web designers. We're pretty look, much looking for all these positions. Um, so what advice would you give to people who want to get started in video game development for themselves? Build games? You know, of course, you want to play games as well to like sort of l learn the field, but build games, and you know, you can do that with Unity. Um, if you want to like have really broad skill sets, you, sh you should also dabble with other technologies. You should try. I mean, it depends on what your interests are. You know, you might want to write your own engine, um, but but uh, you know, Unity is sort of you know a great tool that can tie a team together and make you know a, a, a startup team very very efficient and able to produce you know professional results. Um, so, you know, just get started, this is my advice. You know, there's a free version, um, in, in case you didn't know that. And, uh, and, uh, and so it's like the bar to entry is pretty much zero. Um, and, um, you know, work in teams, you know, whether you actually just build awesome games or go to school to learn it, you know, I think both, both paths are totally va valid. Uh, as long as you're really committed to it and like work hard. Uh, you know, I dropped out of school myself and didn't go that path, but I you know, worked very hard the other path. Um, so uh, that's, that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty much uh, what I would say. One of our team members was had a question for you about your kind of fashion decision with the pop collar. <laughs> <laughs> would you care to talk to us about that at all? Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> it was just a little thing I started doing some years ago, and then uh, my friends started recognizing me by it, like at a distance, uh, and I, I felt that it was kind of cute. Plus, I don't know. Vainly enough, I think it looks good on me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no big, yeah, no big thing. Not a serious question. <laughs> it's okay. So that actually brings me to our last question, mm -hmm. and can kind of be a little bit tricky for some people. But if you had to sum up video game design and development in just one word, what would that one word be? Unity? It's harder than you think, huh? <laughs> Unity? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's slightly unfair. It's not like the only way to do things, but uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I can sum up the industry as, you know, I, I, and I sometimes do in these few words, like, you know, nowhere else. And I know a lot of industries. I've worked in the few ones, and, you know, I'm friends in a lot of them. And I don't think any, any other industry has people that are as smart passionate, creative, and nice. Like, you have other industries where people are very smart, but not so, you know, creative. Or where they're very creative, but not so, you know, nice, or whatever, like, all these combinations. But the game industry is just, it's pretty unique in that. Like, it's a very, very good crowd. And, and people are nice to each other. Like, they're not competitive with each other. Like, even, pe even companies that are competing usually are, like, you know, the people from these companies are friends and kind of relaxed about it and uh, because it's a big world and it's growing and all that it probably makes it easier um, so yeah I know that's not the one word though um, <laughs> well there is a lot of unity within the game development community so. well you know unity is part of community it seems right <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and no and definitely you know unity is doing more than I think I think I can say anyone else in, in like you know leveling the playing field Unifying teams and skill sets and people, um, you know, people are hiring Unity developers now at a crazy clip. Like, you know, if you have a small team of Unity developers that is not doing its own thing, you know, it almost immediately gets hired to do somebody else's somebody else's project because the need for developers is so big, uh, and that's you know that's pretty awesome. All right, well, thanks for talking to us today, David. It's well, been great. You. Thanks.